Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're looking at an economic analysis of financial structure, which is our chapter 8. This chapter discusses how the financial structure is designed and how it promotes economic efficiency. It also gives us a very good insight into why financial contracts are written as they are and why financial intermediaries are more important than our securities market. In this bar graph over here, I have the data from 1970 to 2000 and it's showing us how Canadian businesses finance their activities using external funds that is funds from outside of the business itself and we are comparing this data to that of germany japan and usa as you can see stocks are actually the least important source of financing for businesses even together stocks and bonds are not the primary way in which businesses finance their operations in fact indirect finance that would be involving banks and non-bank loans is many times more important than our direct finance remember direct finance was when we were raising funds directly through security markets. Financial intermediaries, particularly your banks, are actually the most important source of external funds. These are just some of the facts that Mishkin points out in our chapter. He also goes ahead and points out that financial sector is the most heavily regulated sector of the economy and it's only very large and well-established corporations that have easy access to securities markets to finance their activities. Lastly, Mishkin points out that within debt contracts, both collateral and restrictive covenants play a huge role. So so today we're going to analyze these facts and see where are they coming from and what can be the economic rationale behind them. Now my main purpose today is to focus on asymmetric information problems. We touched upon them in one of our earlier chapters. However, today we're going to look at why external financing when it's done through financial intermediaries, so banks and non-bank loans play such a huge important role and how do financial intermediaries actually reduce these asymmetric information costs. In order to do that, first we need to know what is asymmetric information. In order to know what asymmetric information is, you should be able to identify what is symmetric information. In our typical demand supply framework, which you look at in your principles of economic courses, we don't really think about information at all. For example, in a labor market, we assume that employers know the productivity of their workers or potential worker, and thanks to competition, they always pay them exactly the value of what they produce. So price always equals marginal cost. However, this is not true. In most situations, in fact, information is not the same. One party has more information than the other and this imbalance of information is referred to as asymmetric information. Now, there are two specific types of asymmetric information problems that we look at. The first one is your adverse selection and second one is referred to as moral hazard. Adverse selection was pointed out for the very first time by George Ekeloff in 1970 in a seminal paper, The Market for Lemons. And adverse selection is primarily when we have an information imbalance before the transaction occurs. A very common example of this is in your financial markets when you as a borrower are looking for funds from a prospective lender. If the lender does does not know your true quality as a borrower, he or she might be reluctant to lend you his or her funds. And because of this information gap, we'll see that people who are more likely to create adverse outcomes are the ones who are more aggressively pursuing these loans. How does that outcome come about? For that, let's go back to George Ekeloff's example of a used car market. So in a used car market, the seller is promoting or selling his or her car as the best possible deal that you can get. And as a buyer, you obviously don't have the same information as the seller of this car. So Ekeloff pointed this out and he said that essentially in the used car market, we have two types of cars. A car which is in good quality or good repair. It's still a used car, but it's good quality. So we'll refer to that as a peach. And then there are cars which are of actually quite bad quality. And these cars are now referred to as our lemons. Now seller obviously knows the quality of each car. He knows whether it's a lemon or a peach. It's the buyer who in most cases does not know the true quality. Suppose for now that used car buyers are prepared to pay $20,000 for a good quality peach and $10,000 for a lemon. And for now, let's assume that there is complete information across both parties. If there is no information imbalance, the problem is quite simple. We have two separate markets for these two type of cars and exchange will occur in these two separate or segmented markets. So we will have an equilibrium price for a peach as $20,000 and price for a lemon will 
will come out to be $10,000. So we end up paying as a buyer whatever is the true value associated with that particular car. Now let's look at what happens if there is an information imbalance. One party knows the true quality of the car and that would be your sellers of the used car. Buyers in this case estimate a price that they're going to pay based on their expectation of what they are going to get. Let's assume that the probability of getting a used car or a peach is the same so it's a 50 50 chance for either in that case they will be only willing to pay the average price of the two so we can calculate that in terms of probability weighted average where in this case i'm assuming a 50 50 chance that comes out to be fifteen thousand dollars fifteen thousand dollars is obviously a lot lower than the valuation of a good quality car your peach and the same fifteen thousand dollars is a lot higher than the value of a lemon sellers of peaches will withdraw their car they'll take their cars out of the market because they know that this price is not sufficient for the actual value of the car that they are bringing to the market so they will withdraw their peaches the highest quality used cars will then leave the market and therefore we'll be left with the average quality or poor quality cars only once buyers realize that they will reduce their valuation so maybe they'll assume instead of a 50 50 chance there's a 60 percent chance that i'll be getting a lemon in this market and therefore i will change my probabilities accordingly so overall you can see the valuation will go down because i'm giving a higher weight to a bad quality or a lemon in this case and because of this you'll see that even the average quality car a car which is worth fifteen thousand dollars will also leave the market because the new price is actually lower than what the value is for that average quality car you can repeat this in many any iterations and the price will keep on getting pushed down and we'll eventually see that there are actually no good quality cars in this market this phenomena of the bad quality pushing the good quality out from the market is called your adverse selection problem as a result of the information gap that was prevalent before the exchange occurred now adverse selection is also felt in our financial markets in our financial markets we see that if investors have trouble distinguishing high profit low risk firms from low profit high risk firms then we will have a lemons problem owners and managers of good firms have better information than the investors so they know their securities are undervalued in the market and won't bother issuing securities in the first place so again, we see good securities being pushed out because they're undervalued and only lemons or bad quality securities being issued or prevalent in this market. An example of this was also seen during the financial crisis. At the peak of the financial crisis, we saw banks wanting to offload their toxic assets. So that is assets of very poor or bad quality. But of course, banks had better information about how bad these assets actually were than the markets in which they are selling these assets. The markets therefore started to heavily discount the value of these assets that banks were offering for sale. So heavily, in fact, that the banks didn't offer any good quality assets for sale at all. So good quality is now leaving your market. But knowing this and not wanting to buy worthless assets, the markets completely withdrew. So we see a mark. So we see the market for these assets completely collapsing at the peak of the financial crisis, further exacerbating the economic recession that we were experiencing. Now, this was just one example. We see the problem of adverse selection pretty prevalent in all securities markets, and that's why we see that investors not wanting to end up with bad securities do not participate in securities markets as much as we would like to see them participate. So if securities markets don't function very well. This problem of adverse selection in our securities market also explains why stocks and bonds are not a big source of external financing and actually account for a very small portion of external financing by businesses as we saw earlier in our bar graph. So how do we solve the problem of adverse selection? Ecolof didn't just give us the problem itself but he also gave us some tools to reduce this problem. The idea over here is that we have to build trust in these markets in order to make them function well and to create more stability in these markets. How can we build trust in a market where adverse selection is prevalent? So we can eliminate this problem by making all possible relevant information available to investors. And that way we'll have more participation by lenders in this market. One way to do this is through private production and sale of information. And here we see the role of our rating agencies like Standard & Poor's and Dominion Bond Rating Service. These rating agencies will gather information about firms, publish it, and then sell it to subscribers. Now, the problem here is 
that once information is produced, it is disseminated very, very quickly. And once it starts spreading quickly, it translates into lower profits for those who paid to collect that information. And lower profits will translate into not enough buyers for this private production of information. The producers and sellers of this information will therefore also go into losses. And as a result, they stop selling the information as it is not worth their while. Or not enough information will be produced as we would like to have in this market. This problem of the information spreading very quickly and being accessible for people who have not paid for it is called the free riding problem. Because of this free rider problem, enough information will never be produced in your markets privately. So governments have to come in and bridge this gap of information. Governments can always provide information for free. However, that can be very politically difficult, especially when information about bad firms is released. Therefore, we see a huge role for regulation. Governments can regulate securities markets in a way to encourage them to reveal information about themselves. Thirdly, we can use financial intermediation to solve the problem of adverse selection. In order to understand the role of financial institutions, let's use the analogy of the dealer in our lemons problem or in our used car market. The dealer in your used car market is the expert in determining whether the car is a peach or a lemon. So they are producers of this information. And when they buy a car, they can sell it at a higher profit using the information that they have produced. They also avoid free riding, so no one else can use that information. If you have a good quality used car, you are now more likely to sell it to the used car dealer rather than in the used car market at large where you will for sure end up getting a lower price than the value attached to your car. Likewise for the buyers of the used car, the guarantee that the dealer provides whether through their reputation or warranty satisfies the buyers about the price that they're paying. Financial intermediaries are now playing the same role but for now financial interactions. They are experts in producing information. They can sort bad credit risk from good credit risk. They will more likely lend money to good firms who will be otherwise driven driven out of the securities market because of adverse selection problem. They're able to earn a higher return than the interest that they have to pay to their depositors. Financial institutions avoid free riding because the loans that they're making are always private loans. Hence, they end up retaining the profits from the production of that information. This analysis explains why financial institutions are such an important source for external financing. It also explains why large corporations are most likely to obtain funds from direct financing. So that is directly through securities markets. Because larger the company is, the more well known it is. More information about it is available in the market and it is therefore easier for investors to assess its quality. In the presence of adverse selection, we also see a huge role being played by collateral. Collateral is a piece of property that the borrower pledges to the lender in the event of default. In the presence of adverse selection, we see that lenders are more willing to make loans secured by collateral. The incentive for the lender of here is that if there are losses on loans, they can sell the collateral and make up for their losses. And the incentive for the borrower is that because of posting collateral, the lender is now more willing to make this loan. In the absence of collateral, the borrower might never get that funding because the lender will be reluctant to participate in this market. Net worth plays a similar role. Net worth is defined as your total assets minus total liabilities. In the case of default, lender can sell the title to net worth and make up for losses. Firms with higher net worth are therefore less likely to default. They can always sell their own assets and pay for the loan. Therefore, we overall see that higher net worth firms find it easier to get loans. 